I'd like to begin with a simple question. By show of hands, who here enjoys eating? Good. Now, that's a clear majority of us. But if I were to ask you why, well, that's a little bit more difficult to articulate. But most of us, our answers would come in kind of one of two broad categories. Sustenance, nutrition, and well-being being one of them and the other being the more hedonistic sensory pleasures and satiety that we get from food. Now, there's one characteristic that's common to each of these elements, and that is flavor. But what is flavor? Well, this is a question I had just under 10 years ago, and it was sparked by a chance encounter with one Professor Charles Spence. He's head of the Crossmodal Lab at Oxford University, and as an experimental psychologist, has a keen interest in understanding how we perceive flavor. But not just using our chemical sensitive, senses of smell and, and taste, but how we use all of our senses. Now, eating, without doubt, is one of the most multisensory activities that we as humans engage in on a daily basis. And this research is allowing us unique insights into understanding the associations, the perceptions, and the expectations that we have when it comes to the foods that we eat. Now, since having met Professor Spence, my team and I at Kitchen Theory have both engaged in the academic research, but as well tried to find ways of taking the research out of the lab and finding practical applications for the real world. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to share one key insight that I've had over these years. And rather than leave this to kind of a concluding note, I'd like us to begin with this idea, plant the seed, so that we can allow ourselves, lend our imaginations towards the possible innovations in creativity that it holds. And the idea is very, very simple, and it's this. Flavor is a construct of the mind rather than just a sensory perception in the mouth. And although we may localize the perception of flavor into our mouths, it's actually all the expectations, the perceptions, the judgments, and the enjoyment all reside in the brain, which is being fed with rich sensory information from each of our senses. Our sense of taste, touch, smell, vision, audio, all of them paint this rich picture of flavor. Now, if we take this idea that we perceive flavor not in the mouth, but we perceive flavor in our brains, well, this begs the question, how should we be designing food experiences that encourage people towards making more sustainable and more nutritious food choices? And I'm not just talking about in restaurants, but what about in schools, hospitals, care homes? What I'd like to do now is just share three very kind of quick and brief examples, and you're going to play along with me here. I'm going to share three quick examples of some of the research and look at some of the potential applications for this. So here, oh, the colors aren't so clear, but here you have four edible elements. One is red, one is white, one is black, and one is green. Now, what I'd like you to do in your minds is assign each one of these colors to one of your four basic tastes. So, salty, bitter, sour, sweet. I'd like you to assign one of those four to one of the four colors you have. So you have red, white, black, and green, and we're looking to assign a basic taste of salty, bitter, sour, and sweet. Now, there is no right or wrong answer to this. And based on our background, our cultural upbringing, and all the foods we've been exposed to over a lifetime, we'll all have different expectations and different answers. But what's interesting is having gone all over the world and asked now thousands of people about this, we've come to realize that about 70 to 70%, 75% of the world's population will all agree on a specific correlation. 
And I'd like a show of hands as I go through the answers. 70% of people around the world go with white for being salty. Good, clear majority. 70%, and that's maybe because salt is white, so maybe it's that kind of very basic and obvious kind of association. 70% of people go with a kind of blackish brown for being bitter. Good, good majority. Maybe that's because a lot of people wake up in the morning and reach for a cup of coffee, tea. We think of dark chocolate, burnt, charred foods have a kind of bitterness to them, perhaps. 70% of people go with green for being sour. Good, maybe we're thinking of limes and sour, uh, sour candy. Or maybe there's even a hypothesis that it could be a more innate part of our brain that things are kind of unripe fruits, which leaves us with over 70% of the world's population go with red for being sweet. Good, and maybe that's again the, the kind of ripe fruit hypothesis, or maybe it's summer fruits and berries, and the fact that a lot of candy comes in red packaging. But what's interesting about this goes beyond just the fact that there's an association there. If you correlate this with other research that's been done by people like Professor Charles Spence and the Alicia Foundation, they found that if you present people with the, an identical red strawberry mousse on a white plate versus on a black plate, that people will perceive the same strawberry mousse on a white plate to be up to 10%, in some extreme cases, up to 30% sweeter. So if we know that red is the color of sweetness generally, and if we know that the color contrast of red and the, the tone of red can actually impact our expectation and perception and satiety when it comes to sweetness, well, when we're thinking of developing children's desserts, yogurts, snacks, well, maybe this is something that we could take into consideration. Could we reduce the amount of sugar that we put in these foods by 10%, by augmenting the other sensory products of color contrast and the, the degree and tone of redness in the dessert to give them the same satiety and pleasure out of eating these foods, but with a reduced amount of sugar, perhaps. Now, a lot of people never really think of audio, our sense of hearing, as being important to how we perceive flavor and taste. But I can assure you, if I blindfolded you all here now and snapped two sticks of celery, one give a nice, nice sharp, crisp crack, and the other kind of dull, limp snap, which one do you want in your salad? Well, the one that gives a kind of nice, sharp, crisp crack, because even just from what we hear, that's an indication of freshness, that's an indication of nutrition, and that's what we're looking for. So I'm going to play you two soundscapes now. And as you're listening to both of these, I'd like you to associate one of them with our red wine and one of them with our white wine. Sound good? Let's go. There are only five second tracks. Listen to them and just make a quick first judgment. That's piece number one, piece number two. Good, so that second, that latter track that we heard, the deeper kind of cello, white wine, no one, red wine, very good, but why? Why is red wine that deeper kind of cello, and why do most people correlate the white wine with these kind of higher pitch notes and tones? What's interesting is researchers have found correlations between notes, tones, and instruments for sweetness, sourness, bitterness, saltiness, and even umami. Again, why is this important? Well, perhaps when designing soundscapes for food experiences like in children's dining halls, at schools, or in care homes, could we nudge people towards making those right kind of food choices, or could we enhance the dining experience in some way to give them a greater degree of pleasure, enjoyment, satiety? And now the final example I'd like to give you is really, really important to us all. And I think we all know it's important, but we don't know the degree to which it's important. And that's our sense of smell. Now, what's interesting about this is if you ask most people around the world, if you ha and just think about this now yourself, if you had to lose one of your basic senses, what would it be? Most people will say their sense of smell. What's interesting, though, in long-term research, 
they found that people who lose their sense of smell become far more depressed than those who lose their sense of sight in the long term. Because we underestimate how important smell is. But we're going to give this a little test now. We each have a jelly bean, yes? Very good. Now, before I direct you to pop the jelly bean in your mouth, what you first need to do is we need to all very graciously clamp our noses. Now, I'm going to stop clamping my nose because I don't sound as good. But do keep your nose clamped. And the most important thing about this little experiment is throughout it, you make sure that you have no sense of smell coming through. and You keep it nice and firmly clamped. Then I'd like you to take your jelly bean, pop it in your mouth, and chew. And as you're chewing, don't release. Keep it there. And think about what the flavor is. But then what you're thinking now is, can you actually perceive a flavor? Now what I'd like us to do is release. Ooh. Amazing. What just happened there? Well, this is almost that moment where we, we've all had a cold. But in England, what we say when we have a cold is we say, oh, I can't taste a thing. You can keep adding sugar to your coffee, it gets sweeter. Salt to your steak, it gets saltier. But that doesn't improve the flavor. And that's because your sense of smell is inhibited in some way. Researchers estimate that up to maybe 80, in some cases 90%, of what we perceive as flavor actually comes from our sense of smell. Now, taking all this into consideration, and hearing what all the other speakers here have talked about today, I don't know if it's just because I'm a chef, but I noticed that over half, if not 70 to 80% of the people who spoke here today mentioned food in some context, whether it be our relationship with food, whether it be the emotional element, the social element, the, uh, the joy, the satiety, the nostalgia that we get from it. And I leave you this kind of concluding remark, which is, Food is one of the most important elements. We saw the Maslow's hierarchy of needs earlier today. We had food, we had water, we had air. I don't think many of you have taken your friends out for a pint of water or a breath of fresh air. But food we need and food we celebrate with. So surely having a better understanding about the sensory relationship that we have with food can help us not only address some of the food issues that we have in the world, but also help us with designing more nutritious, more sustainable food systems for the future. Thank you.